This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. Crocodiles evolved during the Mesozoic era of 252 to 66 million years ago, and while at a smaller scale now, they have survived mass extinction events, adapted to changing environments, and remain recognizably similar to their ancient ancestors. Our guest today is Gregory Erickson, a professor of anatomy and vertebrate paleobiology at Florida State University and curator at Florida State University's Biological Science Museum, who has built a springboard for modeling the feeding of dinosaurs by measuring the bite forces and tooth pressure in every living species of crocodile. Professor Erickson, thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. This is wonderful. How did you get interested in crocodiles? I got interested in in crocodilians uh, because I saw them as a, a good model to understand dinosaurs, but not just dinosaurs. I'm, I'm interested in what's called the archosaurian radiation. So I'm interested in why crocodilians, dinosaurs, and birds which evolved from them, why were these animals so successful? And being someone who comes from a biology background, I, I feared that we could learn a lot about crocodilians and also their success, but then use them as a model carry over to, to dinosaurs. I think growing up working with animals with my father, supposedly dangerous animals, I guess, <laughs> like, like we know what we're doing. I, I guess I just found my own thing. And I was, I was just really interested in crocodilians and some of my earliest work, when I did my master's degree, I discovered these little growth lines in the teeth of dinosaurs. And I'd, I'd seen this before in mammals, in that they're, they're daily growth lines. And so every day, as, as it, for instance, human teeth, as our teeth develop, a daily growth line gets laid down every day and it mineralizes and leaves a mark. You can count those up and actually figure out how many days it took for a tooth to develop. And I, I found these in dinosaur teeth and I found them in fossil crocodile teeth as well. And so I theorized, well, if we could figure out the biorhythm for those, we might be able to figure out how long it took dinosaur teeth to develop. And so I, for my master's, I, I did work down in Louisiana, chemically labeling alligators and, and basically showed that these are, in fact, what are called von Ehlers incremental lines or daily lines. First time they've ever been shown in a reptile. And then carried that back to the dinosaurs. I was able to figure out, for instance, a, a, a Tyrannosaurus rex, an animal, you know, the biggest tooth of any dinosaur. It took a thousand days to make this tooth. And then by looking at the replacement tooth behind it, so basically I used x-rays of jaws of Tyrannosaurus and, and other dinosaurs for that matter. I was able to figure out about every 770 days as a Tyrannosaur would have shed one of its teeth. I carried that over to duckbill dinosaurs. These animals had up to 1,400 teeth, just conveyor belts of teeth going through. And I figured out that they were wearing down their teeth at about a millimeter a day, necessitating these backup teeth. That's kind of how I started working on crocodilians, but I, I, was, I was intrigued by them. And then when I did my PhD at Berkeley, I was uh, very interested in using growth lines of uh, reptiles to figure out how dinosaurs grew. And so I did a lot of work on known age alligators and, and looking at growth rings in their various bones and use that as a, as a way to not only age living and fossil crocodiles, but then carry it over to dinosaurs as well. So I guess I kind of half a biologist, half a paleontologist, I, I frankly spend about 80, 90 percent of my time looking at modern animals, particularly crocodilians and lizards. The rest of the time is something with dinosaurs. Uh, unfortunately, the, only the dinosaurs get any attention. So I, I guess I'm only known for those those parts of my work. But it shows how they they can feed back and inform today and yesterday. Kind of, it's it's a continuum. I firmly believe the present's the key to the past, and and so if we can develop a new method in a uh, modern animal and show it works, it has some efficacy then I think it has a little more credence when you apply it to an extinct animal, uh, as opposed to coming up with a new method on a dinosaur, but not knowing whether it really works at all in, in the real world. For me, it's it's worked out really well because, you know, when, when I was able to get a job in a biology department, it's pretty unheard of in our field. <laughs> and as the anatomist here at Florida State, for me, it, it, it's, it's wonderful because I, I'm able to publish papers about crocodilians uh, in herpetology journals and you know, working with my crocodilian colleagues and that sort of thing, and then carry it over and get paleontology papers as well. And and so it's uh, going to get the double whammy there, I guess. And so it, it's worked out for me, and I'm very happy with my job, obviously. Uh, what is it about crocodilians that have allowed them to remain relatively similar to their state as in the dinosaur era? Yeah, I'm often asked why crocodilians were so successful. I think they seized upon ecological niches that they're just uh, extremely well adapted for and others can't compete for those same niches. I mean, these are cold-blooded animals. They basically can live off of very you know seasonal resources and these sorts of things. And they're just incredibly 
adept at feeding at the waterland interface, as I call it. Though they are literally the guardians of the waterland interface, and they've been one way for eighty-five million years. Now, that's not to say they haven't changed. Yes, there were alligator-like creatures back in the age of dinosaurs, and there were uh, fish-eating crocodiles and these sorts of things. But those body forms have evolved time and time again. So my good friend and colleague, Chris Brosh, who did his PhD at Texas, he basically showed that the different types of crocodile forms that we see today have evolved independently over and over. But just the same, they always seem to hold down those that waterland interface. One of the really interesting things that he showed was that when you get 35 or 40 foot crocodilians, you know, tyrannosaur sized crocodiles, it always occurs when there was giant prey items. And we see this in the Miocene, we see it in the Pleistocene, we see it back in the age of dinosaurs with an animal named Dinosuchus, which I did some growth work on as well. If there's some big to eat, a crocodile will fill that niche and take it out. I, I guess that's a long answer to your question, but they're just so well adapted for what they do. And I don't think any other animal can displace them. And I don't think any animal ever will for that matter. Part of your crossover work is you've measured the bite force of, I believe, every variety of crocodile that currently exists. Can you tell me a little bit about going through that process? Is it hard to work with crocodiles? Like Sometimes you see the people wrestling them and that kind of thing. And it it seems like in some of those cases, it's definitely a a four or five man job. Well, the story with my work on crocodilian bite force uh, actually goes back to right when I became a new professor. It was about 2000, 2001, something like that. Uh, Paul Serino at the University of Chicago had found this giant crocodile called Sarcosuchus in Africa. And National Geographic reached out to me and uh, asked me if I could figure out his bite force. So I I'd estimated bite forces of T-Rex from bite marks before. And I said, yeah, I could do it. And then they <laughs> and they go, well, well, great. Will you do it? And I said, no. And they go, why not? And I go, well, it would cost money. And I'm a brand new professor. I need to get grants. And if I don't get a grant, then I'm just, you know, the dean's just going to look at me like I'm screwing around. Well, we have grants. Of course, I knew that. Oh, well, really? And so they they sent me a uh, application for a grant. I filled it out one page. <laughs> and, you know, next day I had a grant. I couldn't believe it. It was great to do this work. and Very efficient. Yeah, exactly. I wish it was always that easy. Yeah, so I told the dean. He was real happy. So I got, a, you know, a small grant from National Geographic, which I'm very grateful for. And so up till then, no one had ever tested the bite force of a large animal at least not scientifically or, or to engineering standard. At the time, I'd done my postdoc in biomechanical engineering at Stanford. So I, I knew roughly how to do this. And, and also some of my colleagues when I was at Berkeley for my PhD had been testing bite forces of lizards using little bite force meters. So I just figured we'd just scale it up. And uh, we had no idea how this is going to work. But anyway, what I told Nasty Graphic is that we would test the bite forces, adults of every species of crocodile. And then no one knew what a crocodile could do, period. Uh, what is the bite force of an alligator? What is the bite force of a big crocodile? No one knew. And then we could at least get some idea of what a much larger version would do from the regression lines. So we, we set out and we worked with some engineering colleagues at Stanford and Cornell University. And we developed bite force meters, extremely accurate devices that can measure forces pushing down on a plate. And we decided we'd pad them with leather so it wouldn't hurt the animal's teeth and it had to be waterproof and tough. And again, we had no idea what kind of force we were going to get. Anyway, so we came up with these devices and they, they filmed us doing this, this research. And that's how it got started. The first time I tested a big alligator, I have, I have to admit I was, well, semi-terrified. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know what was going to happen. I, I just figured I'd get it in there. And for all I knew, it was going to chomp down on this thing leverage up in the air and throw me through the sky like wild coyote or something. I, we had no idea what was going to happen. Uh, and looking back, it was pretty foolish. But uh, anyway, we were able to secure these animals and test their bite forces and miraculously it worked out. We tested the bite forces of an adult of every single species of crocodile and uh, we got world record bite forces all along the way. The highest bite force was 3,700 pounds. We have several Guinness records for that work. Uh, that's like setting a uh, oh, setting a mid-sized car on top of the jaws of that crocodile. And that was a 17-foot saltwater croc that we got that from. And then alligator, American alligators could do about 3,000 pounds. And my students always ask me, if you get bitten by a large alligator, what do you do? <laughs> Don't. <laughs> and, well, you know, can you poke it in the eyes? And I, I, I tell them, well, you can poke them in the eyes if you want. They have actually an armor plate that goes over their eyes if that happens. But anyway, it's kind of up to the crocodile. It's If it, if, if it wants to let you go, it'll let you go. If it doesn't, you're lunch. <laughs> That's just the way it is. 
getting back to carrying things over to paleo. So once we once we had the bite forces of crocodilians figured out, one of my graduate students, Paul Genak, who is now at the University of Arizona, he did his PhD work looking at the basically the musculature of crocodilians and also went in and figured out what kind of tensile forces the muscles actually could generate. Given that, we were able to develop a model or he was able to develop a model that very accurately could predict the bite force of any of the living crocodiles just by looking at the skull and making a few measurements. And then he carried that over to fossil crocs. And then we teamed up and carried that over to T-Rex because T-Rex had very similar musculature being given that crocodiles were very closely related to dinosaurs. From that, we estimated that T-Rex was uh, had a bite force of about 8,000 pounds. I drive a big Ford pickup. It'd be sort of like setting. Yeah, I was going to say, you get into the Bronco size or something. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not talking like a Ford 250 here. <laughs> and a three-quarter, three-quarter ton truck, basically. And uh, yeah, that, I mean, that, the force generated, if you push this down with a truck on top of it, you can imagine it would cut a hole through you. Yeah. And the other thing is the, the pressures, the tooth pressures, we were able to figure out at crocodiles. So we, after we test the bite force, we mold their teeth. And we make replicas of that. And I take it over to the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory uh, here in Tallahassee. And we press the copies of the teeth into various materials and we can figure out the contact areas. And so you have the force and the contact area, then you get the tooth pressure. What we found is that some of the crocodilian tooth pressures were like 450,000 pounds per square inch. It's amazing. We found that any crocodile, any adult crocodile can puncture through hide and bone. Uh, with its with their bite forces, uh, and then we found that T Rex was was doing something similar. It was generating I think about three hundred fifty thousand pounds per square inch, and it helps explain some of the bite marks that we've described from Tyrannosaurus rex, explaining how they these animals not only were able to pulverize bone when they bit into uh, prey or scavenged items, they could also pull their teeth right through bone like a hot knife through butter. We see these cuts through the bone. And it's simply because they were just generating these unbelievable pressures and, and these animals, you know, weighed 15,000 pounds. So basically just use brute force. And it's crazy how the how tyrannosaurs fed. With the crocodile bite, what point, like if, if it's a long snout, like does the pressure vary from the nose tip to further back in the jaw? That's a great question. Yes. The forces at the back of the jaw are much higher than at the front. Mm. And if you measure a bite force at, at say, the, the, the canine or canuniform tooth on a crocodile, or back at one of the molariform teeth uh, towards the back of the jaw, as long as you get a measure there, you can just do the math by proportions and figure out what it was at the front versus the back. The highest forces are always at the back of the jaw. It's, it's like using a pair of scissors. You, you call it the back of the scissors, not the tip. That's because the pressures are higher and the forces are higher towards the fulcrum, you know, where the, uh, in, in this case, where the jaw joint was. Yeah, that's an important consideration. So specifically, can I ask you about the impact that NSF support has had on your career? Like, is, is there any specific discoveries that you wouldn't have been able to make? I think almost every discovery uh, that my lab has made is uh, really traces back to the National Science Foundation. They've been incredibly generous, giving money to our various projects. And I'd like to think that it was money well spent. I think we made some discoveries that lead to greater appreciation of crocodilians that are, you know, with regard to endangered animals like crocodilians, like, oh, you know, these are dangerous creatures, et cetera. I think once people appreciate the magnificence of some of these creatures, they're more likely to want to protect them. So I think some of our work has had some conservation impact. And just the same, and crocodilians are charismatic animals, so it's not a great way to introduce the scientific method to people. And I, you know, I'm bridging different fields with my background. I have a, you know, a geology degree, basically a paleo degree for my master's, uh, comparative anatomy for my PhD, and biomechanics and ecology for my postdoctoral research. And so I'd like to think our work also shows how integrative science can be. No matter what your interests are, you know, you can be a mathematician and, and, and make it in sciences, or you can be someone who's a zoologist to make it, or a paleontologist, you name it, uh, engineer. Everything's got something to offer in this very integrative scientific world. I wanted to ask, with having done the National Geographic work, having a process where you're routinely going to schools and interacting with younger people, can you say something about the importance of communicating science to anyone who's interested in anything, really? I believe it's imperative uh, to try to reach out to the public and explain or, you know, our scientific discoveries. Uh, I think it leads to a scientifically more literate society. Uh, I, th I think sometimes scientists uh, will be a little more surprised at how 
you know the thirst that the public has for science and and so it's I think it's really important to anytime one makes a discovery to try to reach out and try to explain the scientific method. I mean, learning the scientific method, I think it's really important with children because it, I think it instills at its essence, it comes down to when somebody tells you something, ask for some evidence in support of it. I think that, you know, that's good in science, but also I think that's just good life skills. But ask for some data in support of things. And I think that's a good message to send as well. I think anytime science can be communicated to the masses, uh, I think it's worth doing. And it, you know, it doesn't have to be dinosaurs or crocodiles and things like that. I mean, people are interested in all kinds of things, material science or engineering feats or you know, space, you name it. You'd be surprised what's out there. And I I'll obviously encourage scientists to try to do their best to speak, not just to other scientists, but speak to the public. So the, the last question I had for you really is what's next with your work? What's next with my work? That's a good question. I have to be honest with you. Uh, I've got about 22 papers I want to get done before I retire. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a quite a few more years to go here, but uh, I'd like any scientist, we build up a lot of projects and that sort of thing that we need to get out. Uh, we want to get back up to the Arctic and keep trying to solve this mystery, basically dinosaur occupation of the Arctic. So we've got quite a bit more work to do there. I'm also doing some work that's funded by the National Science Foundation, looking at material properties of uh, dinosaur teeth, of all things, and also modern mammal teeth. So our tooth enamel, this, this, the outer part of your teeth is a, the hardest substance in the body, and it's a ceramic-like material. And we've been looking at the microstructure of tooth enamel, and we're trying to replicate it because ceramics uh, traditionally are, are like glass and china plate. And if you drop a china plate on the floor, it explodes in a million pieces. But tooth enamels is a ceramic-like material, but it has this crystalline structure that uh, has been a mystery up till now. But technology has advanced to the point where we can not only visualize these things with scanning electron microscopes and other devices, but actually mechanically test the very tiny layers of tooth enamel. It, it's gotten to the point where we can replicate some of these materials. Some of the work we're doing right now is basically figure out what these crystallites do in tooth enamels and and try to replicate them for uh, industrial and aerospace applications. So that's that's some other work that NSF's been funding that uh, we're working on. Right. I can imagine a lot of uh, physical properties that could be implemented from having that bit of information unlocked, knowing how to process f shielding that way or something. Yeah, we could re replace metals with, with ceramics that uh, have comparable, if not superior properties. That they're lighter weight materials and they don't require lubricants. So there's quite a bit of interest in, in some of that kind of work. And, and actually, we're, we're, we're actually replicating some of the dinosaur patterns as well. So like, we might find dino <laughs> inspiration for the next uh, on a spacecraft or something in the future. Who knows? So we're working on that as well. Special thanks to Gregory Erickson. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.